What's that? Okay. Good morning, or I guess it's afternoon now. It's noon, so we're getting to the uh, the real talks of Nauticon. Just chatted with some of you during opening ceremonies there, but without further ado, let's get started here. Mark W. Catfood Schumann started hacking RSTSE in the early 1980s with stone knives, bear skins, and a UCSD Pascal interpreter on a PDP-11. He once implemented a Fortran interpreter as a gigantic Lotus 1-2-3 macro on DOS 3.31. Be surprised how hard it is to get common to work right. And he got paid right out of college to maintain insurance applications in RPG 2.5. Nonetheless, his career of taking software projects that suck and making them not suck remains viable although past traumas have taken their toll. He dedicates this security presentation, Injection Rejection, or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love Bobby Tables, to Jody Foster. Ladies and gentlemen, Mark W. Catfood Schumann. Jody, I know you're out there somewhere. And can I have the projector on? Sound are a little bit off. Okay. Fantastic. Oh, not even going to. Whoa. Let me turn this off. Okay. 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 Thank you. Okay, much better. I love going first. Hey, um, first of all, thank you, everybody. For coming. I was just, um, uh, if you were at Jason's presentation last night about putting on presentations, uh, he just reminded us, yeah, it was a fantastic one, and he reminded us that, you know, you guys don't have to be here. And most of you spent money to be here, you, or you're, you know, participating in the event yourself, you're putting a lot of effort and energy into this thing, and uh, I'm taking up an hour of your time. So I just want this to be a good hour and not an hour where you're on Twitter saying, God, what a horrible waste of time this is. So, so just thank you very, very much for coming. Now, this is, this is kind of an intro level talk, and it's not. But it is very development oriented, a lot of programming oriented. So I'm just really curious, first of all, how, just a little bit of show of hands. How many people in the audience have had an application development disaster? Excellent. Okay, so how many, how many of you actually do application development? And how many of you have had a security development disaster? Okay, this sounds like a lot of questions, but it's a census year, too. How many of you have cats? Okay, so you've definitely had a security disaster, right? Um, and and I, was looking for a, I was looking for a metaphor for what we're doing here today, what, what this injection attack thing is like. And I was putting together some notes a few days ago, and I was... At the, at the home of my significant other. Uh, you might know this person as Dr. Sweetie on Twitter. And Dr. has adopted, has uh, fostered three kittens from an animal shelter. And these kittens are eventually going to be adopted by other, you know, other homes, other cat families. But in the meantime, they are very bad. They, and, and the thing is, they are so bad, you cannot enumerate all the ways they are bad. You can, you can think of the ways they are good. They're cute, they're fluffy, they're adorable, they, they, they torture the dog, you know, things like that. But the things they do that are bad are unlimited, and you cannot anticipate them ahead of time. Um, recently, recently, there was this big potted plant on a shelf, and it was a shelf that was much too high for kittens to get to, right? And why would a cat not go over a big potted plant, but this cat, I don't know if they formed a, you know, a, the cat equivalent of a human ladder. They formed a cat ladder and climbed, you know, three of them. Um, but some cat jumped up almost, almost to the, to the top shelf and was looking for a handhold or a foothold and got the edge of a big potted plant and then took it down. 
And so you hear this giant crash, you come and say, wow, how did, you know, where did that come from? Now, I would not have picked on that. You know, the cats are little, and that's a big plant, but it, it made a huge mess. Just the other day, um, cats technically do not have opposable thumbs, right? But somehow they're opening doors, too. Again, not something you could have anticipated. And you could say, well, you know what? I'm not going to lock the doors because the cats can't open the doors. They don't have opposable thumbs. I don't know. Were they doing like this with their paws? Nobody knows. You can't tell ahead of time. Um, you know, and, it's, and the, the opportunities for urine injection are, are endless. So, so in security, we have the concept of default deny. And if you've studied or implemented any security at all, you know exactly what I mean. When you set up a router, you configure the router to reject all packets first, and then open up holes to let packets through. And I'm talking about the, the, uh, program, the application's program equivalent of the same thing. So we don't enumerate badness, we enumerate goodness, because badness is infinite. And goodness, sadly, is very limited. So, so think, of, think of the cat metaphor as, as, I, as I walk through this. Now, th again, this is kind of introductory. If you've done a lot of application development, some of the stuff might not be new to you. Some of the solutions might be a little bit different. So, and if you don't do software development at all, this is going to be some insight for you. Maybe not something you personally use every day, but um, a lot of perspective and stuff that, you know, stuff that you might want to be aware of when you're asking your development team to do certain things. So with that, I start with injection rejection or how I learned to stop worrying and learn to love Bobby Tables. Who here is an XKCD fan? Okay, who isn't? Who doesn't know what XKCD is? Oh, dear. Oh, you're in for a treat. OK. Well, start right in with, what is this injection thing we're talking about? What is an injection attack? It's any time when user supplies data be, ends up being executed as code, as malicious code. Um, and, show you, um, and I'll show you some examples in a moment. But here are your many attack surfaces. Um, First of all, any time there's direct user input into an application, that is something you don't control. And by the way, if you're doing web application development, the first rule of web application development and uh, security in web application development is that the client side always lies. Am I right? If you're writing, an a right. if you're writing a CGI application, ASP, whatever's happening in the back end, you cannot make the assumption that the user is using a standard web browser. You cannot make the assumption they're using a web browser at all. All you know is there's an HTTP request coming in and a response going back. And what's in that request is completely up for grabs, and it certainly isn't constrained by your front-end validation. So user input is completely up for grabs. Um, do, do you remember when internet shopping carts were really new, and all of and your, the data in your shopping cart was actually stored as form fields in the HTML. OK, yeah, just, yeah, guy in the back. OK, and what was the downside of, as an application developer, you'd have somebody go to the shop, you know, go to your website, go to your e-commerce site, and they pick out a couple items, and they put them in the cart, and you'd like store all the cart information in form variables on the way back or on cookies on the, on the client side. What would happen then? Yeah, so the client side could just change the price. <laughs> If, yes, <laughs> yes, it's been done, yes. Send me, send me all these products and a refund. That would be awesome, thanks, bye. Um, yeah, so clients always lie. Do not trust any, any client site information. Um, an overlooked kind of uh, outside variable is the file system, and I'll show you actually a kind of a exploit that works simply by the existence of a file in the file system, which I have actually seen in the wild, unbelievably. Uh, Clipper on DOS, yes. Um, environment variables, likewise. They're not direct user input, but they don't have control over them. Um, anything in a database, uh, anything interpreted at runtime, and finally, anything that's just in time compiled, something that's like a um, code blocks, lambda expressions, stuff like that. Those things are open to exploitation as injection. And I'll, and I'll give you an example. Here's some, you know, and I was, I always have trouble giving code examples when I'm doing development presentations. And the reason why is you want to write an example that explicitly shows 
the problem and nothing but the problem, right? You don't want to overload the viewer with too much irrelevance. But then you end up writing something really contrived. And all your variables are named foo and bar, and all your inputs are, you know, cat and dog. And it's just, it's boring. And I, I said, okay, put this aside. I said, okay, I'm not going to write up this example right away. I'm going to develop this actual application I've been working on. And then I realized what an idiot I am because I had, in fact, created vulnerable code while I was writing a presentation on not doing vulnerable code. So shoot me. Um, if you could see the red, the dollar sign bogus here, there is your attack vector. If, yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> if in a CGI application, does the word CGI mean anything to you? Okay, it's not computer generated imaging. Okay, we're good? All right. I just want to make sure I'm talking to, I'm communicating on your channel. Um, I've got, a, I've got a function here, this is Perl. I've got a function here that's pulling some flagged entries from user input, from user input, very key. And then I'm going to delete those rows from the database where the ID matches anything in my bogus variable, which is going to be comma delimited, right? And then I just execute the code. This is using DBI interface, that sort of thing. If you don't know Perl, I think you see the general idea. And these, uh, these principles apply no matter what language you're working in. So they give sane input. Say the user checked off box number 303, box number 101, and box number 404. And so that's what gets stuffed into the variable, right? And what gets executed is fantastic. Classic, classic SQL statement. Three rows get deleted. Life is good. OK, that's what it's supposed to do. But what it actually does is here's what the user gives us as input. Remember, you don't trust the user. And you don't trust the client side. And they gave you that in the form variable. Now does that, was that what you were expecting to see? Okay, you're, you're an old timer here, good. Is anybody surprised by that input? Great, I'm dealing with a sophisticated audience. So it gets translated at runtime into these two statements. And the two hyphens at the end are a comment delimiter, so basically anything spare at the end just gets ignored by the uh, SQL interpreter. I hate saying SQL, the SQL interpreter. Anyway. So these two statements execute. We delete the one record and we delete the one row and by the way, we've just zapped the users table. Uh, whatever the payload is, it could be anything. It could be truncate table users, it could be dropping a table, it could be. Uh, a common attack is actually to add a record to the user auth database table so that you've, given, you've created a user ID for yourself. And here's the, here's the method. And by the way, if we could bump up the projector a little bit, that would be great. Um, and here's my get flagged entries method. And here's, a, uh, here's where the automation doesn't help you the way you think it does. Um, Perl, has a, Perl has a mechanism called tainting. Every nod if you know tainting. OK. Basic, the concept of tainting in Perl is anything that's user input, any of those things that I listed before, a file name, uh, anything from the file system, anything from environment, user input, stuff like that, is automatically considered a tainted variable. So every variable in Perl has a value and has a type, has you know, metadata, but part of its metadata is whether it's tainted or not. And so any bit of, um, so you cannot do destructive operations with tainted data if you have taint checking turned on. Always recommended on, on server or web apps, right? The way you untaint data is you pull it as a uh, match variable out of a regular expression. Anything that's pulled as a match variable out of a regular expression is automatically considered untainted. And the concept when Larry Wall set this up was that you could always sanitize your input. You could always match it against a regular expression and say, oh, do I have a match here? OK. And it presumes that the programmer has had some facility in checking to make sure the input is valid. Well, here, we, we didn't check to see if the input was valid. We just got the uh, match expression in parentheses. And we don't see if it's valid. We don't see if it's numeric. And so whatever the user passes into that variable is going to get used. And uh, the tag here is saying, you know, Perl taint fail, pretty much. So Perl did its best to protect you, but you know what? You can't automate this sort of thing beyond a certain point. And the way I'd exploit it is I'd use curl or any client and pass in as a get variable something called flag this, 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 and set its value to 1, so the value gets passed. 
And you'll see the stuff in red, everything from, the, uh, everything from truncate to users, you substitute in whatever you want, URI encoded. And that's your payload. That's your attack. And whatever code you want to put in there will get executed. Um, if you've adminned a web server and looked at, I hope you look at your, uh, your access logs and your error logs, do you see a lot of queries coming in like this? I do all the time. And, and by the way, it's, it's very notable to me that, they're, that they seem to be front page exploits almost all the time. It's kind of cool that I run uh, FreeBSD. Anyway, that's your attacker's payload. And they could put anything in, any SQL command in there that they want. Now, what's the use of this? Okay, XKCD fans, you know the one. The payload is in frame three, or frame two if you count zero based, who knows. <laughs> and you know, I was really tempted to name one of my kids that. And you see what happens is that value gets substituted into, you know, and when you see this strip, you're supposed to think, wow, Bobby's mom, she's elite, right? First off, how did she get that on the birth certificate? That's what I want to know. But anybody, anybody who, could, who could hack their own child's name and uh, use it as an injection attack has earned, some, has earned some geek cred. On the other hand, I think she's wrong about sanitizing database inputs. Sanitizing database inputs is, is wrong. That's, that's enumerating badness. Don't enumerate badness. Attackers are like kittens. They'll attack things you never thought of. So when you're talking about sanitizing your database inputs, you see, you've seen the articles online about that. Go and escape every, you know, escape every semicolon, escape every paren, escape every, you know what? Are you going to escape every single character? You might. But then they'll think of another attack. Enumerating badness is always going to lose. As a matter of fact, enumerating badness is one of the six dumbest ideas in computer security. And I've got a URL to that at the end of the presentation. So does anybody have an alternative to that? What is your alternative to, uh, um, to uh, sanitizing databases? Sir? Yes. Prepared statements and use the user input as parameters. That's that will get you most of the way there. That is, that is the number one thing you can do. And there are a few uh, programming environments, a few runtime environments that still don't support that. Uh, those are environments you want to avoid because they really are kind of automatically exploitable. So yes, you do parameterized queries. Good one. Um, and that's a sense of pre-compiled code. Remember, an injection attack is where user data gets put where code is expected. And the way to eliminate that risk entirely is to have your code always pre-compiled in whatever way it can be done in your environment. And don't let data be interpreted at runtime as code. Um, I'm going to show you in a minute where the famous ampersand operator in Clipper, who remembers Clipper? <laughs> yeah. The ampersand operator that lets you evaluate any variable at runtime and turn it into Clipper code again, actually seen in the wild, have actually seen this happen, where somebody could give a really creative name to a file and watch it get processed. Very cool. Um, again, with the Perl tainting, fantastic mechanism, has saved me many times. You still have to think. You still have to know how to use it. Also, one thing, if somebody knows more than I do about link in .NET, come on up here and explain it to me. But it looks like it has some possibilities for removing, uh, for, uh, removing injection attacks and eliminating malicious queries. Who here is an expert on link? OK, that's your, that's your next presentation. I'm going to research that for next time. But parameterize your SQL statements, always. There is very, 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 very seldom do you, uh, are you unable to do that. And uh, here's, here's what. Uh, Here's, here's how you do a, an insert statement naively. And is that code legible from halfway back? Pretty much. OK, good. Um, the items offset in red are user input. Those are your attack surfaces. If they feed you a name or a company that's, in, you know, that's embedded SQL code like we've seen, that's going to be an attack. So no, that's wrong. Don't do that. 
Here's the right way to do it. You would prepare, you prepare the statement and you use question marks as placeholders in the query. And a, a small thing that I like to do in Perl is if I delimit the string with single quotes, then nothing gets interpolated in that string. So if I somehow have a dollar sign or something in the string, it's not, gonna, it's not gonna have any harmful effect. And then you execute with the parameters and they're replaced one by one where the placeholders are. Now, you've separated data, um, you separated code, data, code, data. The data does not become code, the code does not become data. It's that simple. Any questions on that so far? Let me rephrase that, what are your questions? Fantastic. Now, it, it's, not just, it's not just SQL. Um, that's a legitimate file name, a modern version of DOS. That's also Clipper code. And uh, I actually maintain a Clipper application <laughs> that's gone from DOS 3.x up to DOS 6, and then has been migrated to Linux using Flagship, which is really slick, but they kept the ampersand operator, and this historic legacy application would delete, would clean up files in a directory. In a, it, would, it would do a directory, and then it would parse the output of the directory. Yes, that's right. It would parse the output of the dir command, and then execute what's ever in there. And, uh, and, and execute a, a delete command on whatever's in there, and uh, this would execute as code. We'd uh, append a record to the currently open table and stuff something in the user field. That would actually work. Um, I never had a customer have the guts to try it, but that is a vector. So again, it's a, it's a weakness of evaluating data as code. I should have flipped that first. That's the, that's the payload line. Another one actually seen, I've simplified this like crazy. I actually originally saw this in straight C and the illustration is just far too long so I, I, I made it into Perl. I'm maintaining an application, this is something I did not do myself, thank goodness, and we had input coming in, you know, the input domain value was set, um, was set by us from user input um, or from the environment, I forget which now, and we wanted to do a reverse DNS lookup and so this guy did a system command and actually redirected the output and then parsed the output out of a file, which is wrong a thousand different ways. But if the input domain contained a shell escape, you know, the application's up for grabs. And this was running on, a, uh, this was running on an e-commerce server back in the day. So um, as far as I know, never exploited. Um, I don't even know if it ever went into production, but that was a... That was an interesting vector. So it's basically a, if you name your host cleverly enough, if you name your host with the right escape characters in it, maybe you can get in. That was kind of slick. Now, what automated process, what tool, what technique would have prevented that, app, that disaster from happening? Sir. Right, don't, yeah, don't use the shell. <laughs> Anytime you use shell, Anytime you use a, uh, a runtime code evaluation, uh, anytime you do not have pre-compiled SQL code, any of those things, anything where there's an interpreting step happening and the shell is constantly interpreting, any one of those is, is in tax surface. That's right. Yes, back. Yes. Yeah, if you really needed to execute another program, you could use in, in Unix or in C, you could use the exec syscall, and that one would take an array of strings so that, and those are passed directly as arguments to the, to the application. And if you wanted to redirect the output, you could redirect standard out first and put, yeah, you could do that. Uh, it, it's really painful, but you could do it. Now, my, my bigger picture, that would work. My bigger picture take on this is if you're doing that, what's a nice way of saying you don't know what you're doing? You don't know what you're, or, or granted, have you, have you thrown code together in a hurry for a demo and then it ended up in the live production system? Yeah. <laughs> so, so I'm careful about blaming the programmer, sometimes it's management. But 
But that type of thing can happen. The way you prevent it is, is don't do that. Don't be stupid. Yes, that's what you came to hear. Don't be stupid. But you knew that. Um, and this is, you know, one of, one of many ways in which you make a project that sucks, make it not suck. Um, don't hoard code. Sometimes the worst security holes are from the person. It, it'll be the, the one person who's very invested in the application being done a certain way. It might be the guy who's maintained the application for a long time, and this is the skill set. And actually, you know what, honestly, I'm trying to use gender neutral language, but guys do this, okay? Um, that um, I just finished a project where there was a there was one program in the project who had been on this thing about six or seven years and had some really suboptimal code with a few security holes in it, and it wasn't checked into version control because, oh no, I'm taking care of that code. And it was a real hoarding exercise and we couldn't fix it because you know, the one guy maintained that thing. He doesn't work there anymore. Um, hoarding code, when one person sees it and one person maintains it, it's almost always a security hole. Um, don't optimize. You know, this may be a data structure that's vulnerable, but it's fast. Well, it's not fast when your server gets taken down. And review your code constantly. That's part of the part of the not hoarding. And this works in any language in any environment. Always do code reviews. And by always doing code reviews, I mean all the time. There are some shops that do a code review every week. You know, Friday when everybody's fried anyway, you go into the meeting room and print stuff out and you pass it around. Actually, of those of you who work in dev, you know, development environments, how many of you even do regular code reviews with your teammates? Okay, it's a minority. It's a 20% it's a minority. Okay, that should be a lot closer to 100% because that is, um, on one level, it wastes time because new code is not being written. On another level, it makes the code you do write a lot more effective. And actually, uh, gentlemen in the back, would you, would you waste time really effective? What, what's your experience? Really? It does not, it, does it get reviewed before or after being checked in? You don't work for like DOD or something, do you? Wow. <laughs> that, that's fantastic. Now, if you've heard of extreme programming, I do not necessarily embrace all of extreme programming all at once, and a lot of shops are not ready for that. But I love the concept where they say code reviews are good. Let's do extreme code reviews because that's extremely good. And extreme code reviews is having two developers in the cube, sharing a keyboard, sharing a monitor. It sounds crazy. It's so crazy it really works. And management flips out when you, uh, when you suggest this because they're paying two people. Uh, one way I found to deal with that is to just say, oh, that's okay. I won't get paid for this. No, that doesn't really work. But <laughs> You might not get twice as much code done, but you get twice as much usable good code done. So do code reviews constantly. And by constantly, I mean you're typing code, your partner is reviewing it, really, and saying, what did you mean by that? Or isn't that a security hole? And you switch off, and then your partner is typing code, and you say, what were you thinking here? That's, that's never going to terminate, sort of things like that. It is way more efficient. It really is. And also, another extreme practice is let your unit test drive development. And unit tests are often done to make sure that a database gives the right result, stuff like that. But you can also have security related unit tests. And so you write the test for the code, you write the test first and then write the code to support the test. These things work in any language, any environment, really. There's uh, no exceptions. And finally, still don't optimize. I find very, very few applications. I, I do a lot of corporate IT shop kind of applications. I'm not, uh, I'm not writing motion controllers. I'm not writing anything for NASA. I'm writing a lot of business applications. And the optimization is always premature, except at other times when it's still premature. Um, only very rarely do I see database and user-centric applications really need a lot of speed boost. And I see a lot of security holes being made in the name of, op and made of runtime optimization. And so I brought you a few good URLs. The six dumbest ideas in computer security. And if, if you haven't, first of all, you'll be able to download these slides later. Okay? 
And if you're having trouble making that out, you really can just Google for six dumbest ideas in computer security. It's a fantastic article by Marcus Raynham, who is a you know, huge security researcher. Um, there are many, many articles on the basics of SQL injection. And uh, that's, that's one of them. And I, it's a good overview. And also, Coding Horror. If you do not know this blog, you should. Coding Horror is uh, Jeff Atwood's blog, and he's the guy who started stackoverflow.com also. A um, couple of great sites, and he's got a, just a basic introduction to doing parameterized SQL statements. Any, um, what are your questions at this time? Yes? Yes. A actually, defense in depth is huge. You know, uh, if you've got an application firewall, you've done a good thing. And I, I think I, would, I wouldn't denigrate that. Um, sweeping something under the rug would be the exception handler that doesn't log anything and just kind of lets you go on, that sort of thing. I've seen that done. Um, no, I think um, an application-specific firewall would be a good thing. I, don't see a, I do not see a lot of them deployed in the real world. They seem, to, me, to me, they actually are often more theoretical, and maybe it's my environments. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yes? You know, people talk about Band-Aids like they're a bad thing. <laughs> um, yes, that could happen. That could happen. And I think, um, I know you didn't come all the way here to be told, don't be stupid, but I think you have to do two things at the same time. If you need a Band-Aid, go ahead and get the Band-Aid. There's nothing wrong with doing what it takes to stop the problem immediately. But also, it's got to be on your, it's got to be on your, uh, if, you're, if you're in an agile shop, you put it on your task backlog, uh, you consider it technical debt, or you just make sure it gets on your project list. Um, I, you know, I wish I, ha I wish I had a really brilliant answer to that, but sometimes that's what it takes to, you know, to get the application uh, functioning today, is to is to do that. You use a shortcut. It's for yes, exactly. Yeah, it's exactly. Yeah, you can only use a tourniquet for a few minutes, right? Yeah, especially around the neck. Okay, other questions on this? Yes. Yeah. There's a, there's a few, yeah, there's a few things. Um, I, and I was cognizant of how much time I had here. Have you heard of the lateral SQL injection? Yeah, another good thing to Google. It's really interesting. Um, you can, um, a, a, an SQL command that contains a, a date parameter um, you figure, well, what, what bad thing can happen to a date? You can't just put arbitrary string data into a date. Guess what? In Oracle, you can. In Oracle, you can manipulate the date format. So the date format could be Bobby Tables. <laughs> and then execute a command that reads a date and, embed, you know, and embeds it in a database command. Yeah. Um, I, I'm still boggled as to how a external date format could affect the workings of a, of a SQL command, but apparently it can happen in Oracle. So that can happen no matter how much you parameterize your queries. If somebody's got access to change the date format per session, that's another possibility. That's the first thing I could think of offhand. Um, another time is sometimes I break my own rules. Yeah. And you might have a circumstance where you do not know ahead of time what field you're going to be updating. And sometimes that field name, I've written queries where the field name is itself a variable. You can't parameterize that, have that happen. Uh, things like that. Um, there are also, um, I haven't studied enough. Right, that's right. And that's, that's, my, that's my little excuse is that, well, the field name isn't from user input. And I'm just waiting for for myself to do something really dumb, like get the field from metadata and have somebody put something really evil in the metal metadata, that'd be really cool. Of course, if they're doing that, they have SA access anyway, so I'm not, you know, you know, they're, if they have SA access, why are they, why are they bothering me? Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, also it's one of those things of the guy who used to be SA but doesn't work here anymore. Yeah. <laughs> okay, did, did I answer that well? Okay. Any other questions on this? Cool. Um, and this is me. I make projects, not so that is my project planning tool, my Magic 8 Ball. And I do make a project that sucks. I make it not suck. Sometimes it's technical, sometimes non technical. And I've got a, uh, I've got a paper that is uh, somewhat security related on the eight ways your project probably sucks. And if you just give me your business card later and just kind of you know, write, write suck on it, well, don't write suck on it because that's like really bad, but write the word suck on the card. And so like, I'll collect that and that's like your little optimum getting that report. That would be awesome. And uh, also, these slides are going to be available right there. It's criticalresults.com slash. Not a con six. There's a placeholder there right now. But if you check in tomorrow, the slides will be up there. And coming up next, Super Jason Scott, presentation 64. Um, Jason is a great speaker. I saw him for the first time last night. He's definitely worth sticking around for. I don't know what's going on in the other rooms. But if you stay here, you will not be, you will not be disappointed. Um, I believe it has to do with game programming. So did you get what you came for? Kind of. Okay, any other questions on the topic? Any other questions on any topic? Does anybody want a kitten? Okay, thanks. So if you have anything else, uh, you know, come on up afterwards and I've got time after this, uh, after this presentation. Thank you very much.